Good day, YouTubers. And um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is something that I have wanted to talk about for quite a while, but it, until now it just didn't seem, it didn't feel right. Um, what I'm going to talk about was very raw at the time and yeah now I feel comfortable enough to talk about it and it is the real reason the main reason I mean there were several reasons but the the main reason why I left YouTube and moved to Vimeo on demand now I'm going to be showing a bit of footage later which I'm sure many of you out there will find quite upsetting. Um, I did. I, I hadn't really looked at it until a few days ago and yeah it's very raw. So why did I leave YouTube for Vimeo? Now, before I left YouTube, I'd just finished filming and uploading my season three, which, if some of you remember, was when I travelled from Middlewich to Parbold. And I was going through a funny, weird titles kind of phase, and the last episodes of yeah, of season three, episode six, I called The Path of the Righteous Man. Now, in the video, you saw that uh, I was verbally abused by a disgruntled motorist at a lift bridge. He wasn't happy that I'd closed the road so I could get the boat through. And then the very next day in Wigan, uh, I was burgled and someone stole my beloved jerry can and then the next day or two days later not much further down the canal a shopkeeper told me that I can't be a real boater because I haven't bought any alcohol so I thought well thank you very much so yeah and then I continued on and making my way to Parbold and New Year's Eve arrived And I moored up. And normally I don't bother with New Year's. I mean, it's all to me. I mean, it's just a, it's a cycle. I mean, it's just another day of the week. It's a change of numbers. You know, so what? But it was the first time, my first New Year's, where I had literally been on my own, alone. Nobody else around. I was in contact with nobody. And it got to about 10 o'clock and I thought, you know, I'm not normally one for going to the pub on New Year's, but I, th I was alone. So I thought, I know what, I'll go to the pub. And I looked on Google Maps and there was a pub about a mile and a half away down the towpath. So I thought, right, I thought, what the hell? bung my coat on and me furry hat and and off I went to the pub I got to the pub about half past ten went in and it's New Year's Eve so it's it's a bit rowdy but you know people having a good time seeing in the new year I ordered my pint and I sat down at a table with this couple on who turns out they were getting towards retirement age and they were wondering what to do and we got talking about narrowboats and told about what I do and you know my experiences on the canal and they were genuinely interested and they, they thought oh, that's, a, that's a good idea and then I finished that pint and I ordered another pint I ended up having two pints of real ale so I, I was in the pub for about an hour 
it's half 10 to half 11 and it's now getting really rowdy and I thought I don't want to hang around for the traditional oh the acquaintance me for that and all that stuff so I left half half past 11 and I remember walking out the door I said my goodbyes to the couple and I walked out the door and round the corner and that's when it happened um I felt I didn't see it but I felt an almighty sideways blow from behind woof, to the side of my head and it was it was a real blow it's like I'd been hit by a sledgehammer and I hit the deck and I was on my hands and knees and I, I never saw who it was but I think there must be it must have been at least two people, a minimum of two people, because I, they started kicking me in the head. And it was like, boom, boom, boom. It can't have been one, because they'd have had to kick me that way, go around the other side, kick me that way. So it must have been two, and it was boom, 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 like that. And it went on and on and on. Uh, even to this day, there's massive holes in my memory. I mean, uh, yeah. It's like little flashes, little clips, little scenes. Boof, boof, boof. And yeah, it was on and on. Boof, boof, boof. And then they started on my body and my arms and my legs. And they stamped on me. They kicked, they kicked the bejesus out of my body. And I must have, well, I passed out as far as I know. And I don't know how long I, I was out. But... Some time later, however long it was, minutes, seconds, hours, I don't know, someone was tugging at me, saying, get up, get up, get up. And I said, I don't want to. But in the end, I got up and I sat down on a wall. Um, I mean, it must, I must have been out for some time because shortly afterwards the police arrived. And, yeah, because I mean, you know how long they take to respond. No offence, any police watching. Um, so I must have been out for, I don't know, half an hour, an hour. And miraculously, for some strange reason, the police just instantly assumed I was drunk. Because, I mean, I didn't know at the time. I kept complaining. I was like, my speech was slurred. And I found out afterwards I had massive head injuries. Um, but the police just assumed I was drunk. And they kept saying, when you sober up, sir, we'll take a statement. And I'm going, I'm not drunk, I'm not drunk. And I kept going, oh, why, is, why is the side of my head, uh, my, my head hurt? Uh, you know. And I felt my ear, and it was out here. And the side of my head was just, just and this side, not so much, but swollen in my ear. <coughs> and... Yeah, they asked me if I wanted to pursue the matter, and I, I like I I tried to put things behind me, and I said I don't want to pursue it. I mean, for a start, we had no idea who they were. I mean, the chances of finding at least two people, something that happened in the middle of nowhere in a pitch black, and I never saw them, and there was no witnesses. What's the chance of? finding them and and it would have gone on and on and on and I didn't want that I just wanted it was horrendous it was a horrendous period you know the, all the minor things that had happened like in the few days beforehand so I just I just dropped it but the police said if I changed my mind they, they rather soberingly told me that um, if I decided to go ahead and they investigated it they would treat it as attempted murder <laughs> That's um, that's quite a sobering thought. You think, you suddenly realise that somebody did their utmost to kill you. I mean, the amount of blows to my head I had, I sort of think, you know, most people would have, they'd be dead. So that's quite a sobering thought. And they took me to the hospital and it was New Year's Eve and it was full of drunks and people with 
bruises and cuts and oh it was just, it was it was awful it was like yeah it was like some internment camp and i sat there and they bought me a cup of water and then said we have to go now kevin and that was it and i sat in there for probably 15 minutes and i thought i don't want to stay here I thought this is yeah what am i doing here i want i want to be back on my boat so i got up and left now i'm assuming i was in the middle of wigan or i was somewhere in wigan at wigan general i didn't look to see what the name of the hospital was i mean i, I wasn't with it and i just started walking and i also suddenly felt so alone it was just like you know, there was no one around it was four o'clock in the morning totally i had no idea where i was headed so i phoned up the only person that i thought could help because I, di I didn't there was you know i didn't know anybody else and i phoned the ex-wife and i sent her a picture a, a selfie and she was distraught i was distraught i'd never i cried over and over but it wasn't like a <laughs> kind of cry it was a real <laughs> everything just <laughs> proper the past 49 years of my life just came out everything in one huge thing <laughs> and it stopped and i'd i'd be speaking to my wife and just saying I don't know what to do. I'm so alone. I'm so scared. I don't know where I'm going. I'm in the middle of nowhere. And and it kept happening Woo! over and over. Woo! And I thought I just want to get back to the boat. So the the location services on my phone, my old phone that I had, was intermittent, and I could not get a fix on Google Maps of where I was. And I didn't know where I was. But for some reason, I remembered as I stepped out of the boat to go to the pub, I saw the moon and it was a full bright moon. And I remembered that I stepped out onto the towpath and the moon was up there. And I looked around, and there's the moon. And I thought, right, if the moon's there, then the boat has to be over there. Unless I'd been taken by to the hospital in the opposite direction, in which case it was over there. But something told me to go that way. And for two hours, I walked along if you've been a, a victim of you know a serious attack every single noise every person stranger you happen to see walking about you think it's going to happen again and you really do worry it's going to happen again and i just kept my head down and i walked for two hours and by some miracle i came to the canal and it was a bridge i arrived at a bridge that i'd remembered passing say two miles or wherever it was earlier that day so I got onto the towpath and I walked and seven o'clock in the morning I got to the boat and I got onto my boat and I shut the doors and I filmed this clip and uh, yeah like I say It's um, it's very raw, but um, necessary. So here we go. I really don't know what's happening. I was verbally abused at Plank Lane Lift Bridge. Then I was robbed at Wigan. And now, New Year's Eve, I had two pints of ale and I walked out of a pub and I was set upon. And they kicked the crap out of me. I think I've broken my finger. My lips all swollen, as you can see. I'm in a bit of a mess and my ear appears to be protruding out the side of my head. 
what's obvious to me here is that I've been crying a lot and I can tell you while I was filming this I was doing my utmost to hold it back I was it was a continual stream of real full on so I'm quite proud of myself there <laughs> I managed to hold on to it. I was taken to the hospital, but it took so long. I was just sat there. I got up and walked out. I, I, I don't know what's going on. Why? I just traveling along, minding my own business. There, uh, the world, the world is just, it's knackered, pure and simple. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I'd, I'd spent an unknown amount of time lying face down in the mud, so uh, yeah, I was in a bit of a state, but um my jacket I found out later was plastered in boot prints where they just they just stamped on me just repeatedly um, yep done something to my finger I couldn't move it done something to my hip uh, I had quite a limp and my head was just I, I, I was I was like John Merrick, you know. I was like Elephant Man. It was just, yeah. Um, and to her credit, my ex-wife came down later that day in the morning. You know, later that morning, she drove the hundred miles or so, and she was just such such an incredible comfort. You wouldn't believe it. Uh, but the, the main thing was I, I, I spent probably about seven days where I was moored up and and then I, I just decided, you know, I didn't go outside. If I needed food, I waited till it was dark. Uh, and um, everywhere I went, I was just, any noises behind me. Yeah. I was, I went to the nearest like sort of village town and I heard someone walking along behind me and I just whipped into a shop, which was just closing. Uh, and it was a wool shop. And it was full of old deers buying wool. And I, I, I stood there, almost covered in bruises and what have you, in a wool shop. I mean, why would I be in a wool shop? I, I, I don't knit. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and waited for the person to walk by. Um, but I, I, I just, as far, as far as I was concerned, it was all over. My canal life is over. And I, I ran. My uh, my wife um, organised and booked me into a marina on the Rufford branch uh, near Berska, you know, at Rufford itself. And I got to Berska where the episode sort of finished until the four months later bit when I was talking to the camera. And I went up the Rufford branch and there's about six or seven locks, but it's, and it's the middle of winter, the, the canal's frozen, I'm going along, crunch, crunch, plates of ice, and but I didn't care. I just wanted to get off the canals, somewhere I felt safe. And I got to the marina, settled down in there, and I, and for probably two weeks I hibernated. And over the two weeks, I, I just thought to myself, why, why am I doing this? Yeah, I'm I'm going places. I'm I'm traveling and adventuring far further than I'd ever intended, and I was doing it for the videos. I loved I loved making the videos. I wanted to create this sort of historical travel document of the canals as they are today, and for people to enjoy. I love making stuff that other people enjoy. You know, to hear that people have enjoyed, been in, you know, been inspired, moved, whatever, by what I've created.
you know, it, it's it's fantastic feeling, and and I love doing it. But I thought to myself, you know, I'm I'm heading up through some of the worst hot spots on the canals, you know, and I'm doing it for three dollars a day. You know, I you know, I am literally risking my life for three dollars a day, and. I thought, you know, it can't continue. And at one point, I, I, that was it. I thought, right, sod it. You know, I'm gonna become a proper liverboard. I'm gonna find a nice stretch of canal and I'm gonna mill about and move around of my own accord and all that stuff. But the creator and explorer in me kept popping up and saying, you know, no, this is good. You know, it, it's it's ultimately it will be good. So I thought, how can I generate some kind of reward, you know, financial reward, something that I can I can live on? Because bearing in mind, I'm travelling around the canals, and you know that means I can't hold down a job. It's not possible to hold down a job in one area and travel four or five hundred miles away. And commute to that job it just and travel along and film at the same time it just doesn't work it takes time to edit everything and everything that goes with it it all takes a lot of time so I came up with I did some research I discovered Vimeo on demand pay-per-view and I spent four months in the marina doing nothing but just working on that I took every video I'd already done so far which was three episodes in my Christmas special and I tightened up the editing, got rid of any rough bits, took out all the Nicholson guide maps, put in Google Maps with all the stuff that you have to do to generate the Google Maps, put all those in, new titles, gave it more of a, gave every episode a coming up next time segment and just basically got it all ready. Put in a watermark because believe it or not, I was suffering a pop the problem of piracy, <laughs> which is sort of a, it's a, it's a confirmation in a way. Um, yeah. And I set up Vimeo On Demand, which costs me £148 a year for the privilege of putting my videos up so that people can buy them. And I set all that up. And then I left the marina and decided to embark on the Leeds Liverpool. I also filmed the video saying about I'm leaving YouTube and explaining the reasons why, but obviously not this reason. And um, yeah, explaining that I was only earning $3 a day and that I couldn't possibly live on that. So I moved on to Vimeo and touch wood, it was a good choice. There you are. I hope I haven't uh, depressed you all too much, ruined your day, <laughs> um, but now you know. I'd just like to say that um, Robbie Cumming, uh, I met him when I was coming down the Tidal Trent. We met up and he filmed an extremely good tour of my boat, very enjoyable video. And I have to say Robbie is absolutely a wonderful bloke. Um, and uh, yeah, we had a good old natter about everything. It was just a really, really enjoyed, a very enjoyable day. So I've put a link below in the description to that video on his channel. It's only just gone up. So yeah, hope you enjoy that. Thank you very much for watching and cheers for now.